Hello, everybody. This is the first time I've done a uh, formal lecture um, online like this, but hopefully it won't be too impersonal. Um, I'm very happy to be able to, to address uh, all of you today. The Maritime History and Marine and Underwater Archaeology Facebook group. I don't know exactly who this is going to go out to, but I assume a lot of people uh, in India and elsewhere around the world. And you'll be seeing this, of course, um, recorded at some future date, I guess on July 12th. So um, I'm going to talk today about, obviously, the title here. It's about our excavations at Berenike on the Red Sea coast of Egypt. Uh, and the project started in 1994. And for those of you unfamiliar with the site, if you take a look at this map, uh, it shows you, of course, um, those portions of the, uh, of the old world, as we call it, across the pond, uh, and the various major trade routes uh, linking these vast areas of Europe, Africa, and Asia together. So obviously today we're going to concentrate only on uh, the site of Berenike, although of course it was only one of many uh, points along this vast uh, network that uh, joined, as I said, three continents together, basically uh, linking the uh, northwestern Indian Ocean via the Red Sea uh, to uh, the Mediterranean. So you see the location there, it's circled. And of course, uh, since mainly we're dealing with the maritime aspect of this trade, uh, the ancients would, of course, had to be very familiar with the monsoon wind patterns in the Indian Ocean, which you see down there on the bottom right, and the wind patterns uh, in the Red Sea, which you see on the left. So these uh, dictated sailing times to and from uh, Berenike, and obviously it points further south in the Red Sea, and then uh, across uh, southern Arabia to the Indian subcontinent and south along, of course, the Indian Ocean coast of Africa. So here's a little... Uh, uh, more close-up view of the site. Uh, the the uh, satellite image in the bottom left uh, very clearly identifies the Sinai Peninsula at the north there, and the little arrow points to the location of Berenike. Uh, and again, if you look at the bottom right, you can see a, a more regional map of Berenike and a number of the sites uh, associated with it that unfortunately we're really not going to have time to talk about uh, today extensively. This shows you uh, a, a view of the site uh, in the trench, trenches that we have excavated since 1994. We have not been able to excavate continuously every season since 1994. There have been periods uh, when we did not receive permits and were unable to excavate. It, it, it looks fairly impressive, but it, gives, uh, it projects really a false sense because um, very few of these trenches have actually reached bedrock or virgin soil. And uh, we've really only probably excavated at most maybe 2% of this massively huge site. Uh, one of the things that's assisted us in locating trenches um, with a great deal of success is uh, magnetic mapping or geomagnetic mapping. And this basically is very simple. It's uh, taking an X-ray of what's beneath the soil for a distance, a depth of about anywhere from 50 centimeters to a meter, sometimes a little bit more. And you can see very clearly uh, on the right, to the right of the red box, uh, uh, it gives a very good idea of the outline uh, of the major part of the city from Roman times anyway. Uh, to give you an idea of the size of the site, the red box there, as you see, uh, is uh, 10,000 square meters. So it will be many uh, generations before this site is, is completely excavated, if ever. It was founded around 275 BC uh, by the Ptolemaic monarch uh, Ptolemy II of Philadelphus. And for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, Western, that is, Mediterranean history, the Ptolemies were a dynasty established in Egypt uh, after the death of Alexander the Great. Ptolemy I was, in fact, one of uh, Alexander the Great's generals. So anyway, Ptolemy II founded a number of ports uh, along the Egyptian Red Sea coast and further south along the Red Sea coast of Africa. And we know a fair amount about uh, this period, uh, although not as much as we'd like. If you see our magnetic map, you can see an outline there of uh, the Hellenistic, that is the Ptolemaic period fortifications and some of the other buildings that we have 
uh, excavated. And I'll just show you a few uh, pictures of this. If you take a look at the top left, that's the foundation of part of the city wall uh, from this period. And in the top right here, if you can see my cursor, uh, this is another section of the wall. This is the remains of a very badly robbed out tower along the wall. And then this area here, which you see here is the same as up here. It's part of the wall, city wall later on, uh, excavated down by us to reach this uh, very interesting uh, well that produces uh, something on the order of two to 3,000 liters of water um, uh, in the course uh, of, uh, of a day. And you can see here the well. Uh, and of course, it also doubled as a cistern. We have a tunnel in the back here that leads off to an area uh, that we're not sure of because uh, as you can see, it's clogged with sand and we have not had the opportunity to excavate that. But we do have ample evidence for its date. It was certainly used in the early period after the foundation of the port. Uh, all of the pottery dates to this period. You see a number of amphoras. Uh, here's one, the one with the red arrow indicates uh, this name, this depinta, which says Antiochu in Greek, which means of Antiochus. We're not sure who that individual was. And then as we've excavated further in the area, we've come up with this, uh, here's the well, this massive hydraulic complex, uh, which uh, might be uh, in part a bath from this period and partly a water catchment system. Uh, it seems to have been a little wetter uh, in the third century BC, and there's indications that some of the rainwater uh, was uh, also siphoned into cisterns uh, adjacent to the well. We've certainly found evidence uh, of what the Ptolemies were most interested in, and that was the acquisition of war elephants. Of course, they did not have access um, uh, to the Indian variety. Uh, so, of course, they sought those uh, in East Africa, mainly the bush and the forest elephants. And we found the remains of what we're pretty sure is an elephant retaining pin here, where they would have unloaded the elephants and kept them here prior to marching them across the desert to the Nile. The scale circled in red is a 50 centimeter. And we've also found actually um, osteological evidence of the presence of the elephants. This is part of a skull of a juvenile elephant, and we see some molars here, parts of teeth. Uh, the DNA is too degraded to identify the species, unfortunately. And here's some other evidence uh, from the, this period, uh, stamped amphora handles, um, uh, another broken amphora. This uh, horse-headed horse was a Egyptian sun god crocodile, and this cartouche, uh, which in fact dates from the 10th century BC, must have been someone's heirloom. Now let's take a look at, again, the magnetic map, and we're going to start out here uh, taking a look at some early Roman burials circled in red here. These burials uh, were interred after the uh, well had fallen out of use, um, and so it wasn't a regular cemetery, it was sort of a makeshift, uh, which you can tell by the orientation of the burials. They were basically put in the ground uh, as a soft ground presented itself, and the arrows here, here, uh, represent some of these burials, which you see close close up here. The amphoras here, which you see here, are part of a hydraulic system, and you see a close up of those here. Now, these Roman burials are from the early Roman period, which is uh, basically the first century AD. Um, many of them have no grave goods. Some of them have some. Uh, here's uh, a headless man wearing an iron ring from this area near the cistern. And this is an older man who was carried, covered in a burial shroud. His iron ring is here. And then a number of beads, interestingly, imported from the subcontinent. And then here's a burial of a, of a tall woman whose head is covered, as you can see, with the remains of an amphora. And then, uh, like I said, I could show you lots of burials. Uh, you get the idea. The, these are some more that we've recently found in the, in the past two or three years. Uh, here is an individual. Uh, often the bodies are too decayed to even identify gender. We can usually establish age. Uh, this actually had the remains of the wooden uh, coffin made of teak wood uh, imported from India. Here's some of the burial goods at the foot of this individual. Here you see them here. And here's another view after we cleared off the burial shroud of this individual. So these uh, burial goods here would have been found down in this area. And then we have this very interesting burial. See a cross burial. So clearly there was an earlier burial and then later on someone unknowingly dug into this 
and buried a second individual, as you can see, across at perpendicular angles to the uh, uh, previous individual. Uh, and we have, of course, a number of burials, other burials in the city, as well as hundreds of them uh, outside the city. Again, we don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Um, but the formal cemeteries tended to be, as was common in, in Roman times, uh, and in Hellenistic and Greek period, uh, they tended to be on, on roads leaving uh, urban centers. And so you see the red arrow here. Uh, this is towards the northwest of the city. This uh, partial cemetery we excavated in 2001, and it included this little cyst burial of a two-year-old girl who was covered uh, with a pot shirt. She'd had a burial shroud, and she also had some beads uh, buried with her. Um, now, uh, we've also, of course, one of the, one of the most uh, exciting places to excavate is a trash dump, at least in Egypt, because the preservation is so good due to the dry climate. And we've had uh, a lot of interesting finds from our early Roman, that is first century AD trash dump, including the discovery of an animal cemetery. Now, animal cemeteries are not unusual in ancient Egypt, but as you'll see, ours is, uh, is a little more unique than, than the run-of-the-mill uh, animal cemetery. So the trash dumps are excellent places to find written documents, such as papyri. And here you have a selection of these, a bill of sale for a donkey, uh, a letter from a mother named Hikane to her son. In fact, she's complaining about the fact that her son hasn't written to her recently. So this is a, <laughs> this could have been written any time in history. And then we have a, a poetic papyrus here dedicated to uh, the goddess Sibylle. Uh, these kinds of documents also include broken pot churds with writing on them, which in the West we call ostraca. And uh, these are found usually fairly shallow. You don't have to excavate down too far. And we found hundreds and hundreds of these. This is a basket lid. Uh, containing a number of ostraca that have been thrown out. This gives you an idea of what they look like when they come out of the ground. And here they are cleaned up. This particular set has to deal with the Roman army's control of the acquisition, transport, and distribution of fresh water in the city. And to give you some idea, of course, oftentimes the ostraca are in, in not very legible, you see on the left. And we've uh, discovered that infrared photographies can sometimes, not always, produce a, a much improved image. So you can see this is the same pot shirt, uh, but on the right we've used infrared photography. And as you can see, there's a lot more legibility there uh, than, uh, the, than the example on the left. Um, so uh, the trash dump also has turned up, this early Roman trash dump has turned up in addition to all kinds of documents and other interesting finds. Uh, the remains of some earlier human burials. This is a uh, remains of a 25 year old man. And then we've turned up well over 400 animals buried here. Most of them seem to be family pets. Uh, you'll see why we know that in just a second. The vast majority are cats and kittens. But we also have dogs, baboons, uh, birds, monkeys. Uh, and interestingly, several of the monkeys uh, come from North and South India. And one of the cats actually either comes from Northern India uh, or from Central Asia. We know that from, uh, from uh, DNA analysis. Anyway, this dog, as you can see here, was clearly someone's pet. Uh, he was carefully covered with a mat and then covered with broken pieces of amphoras. Uh, our osteologist, our bone specialist, was able to determine that he died from osteosarcoma, that's a bone cancer, at, at about the age of four. And we have an idea of what he might have looked like in life. This is a the same breed, maybe not the same coloring. And then here's some other examples. And again, how do we know they're pets? Well, again, the, the kinds of burials are given. Many of them, of course, are wearing collars made of iron or beads or a combination of those. So you can see uh, this cat with an iron collar. Here's the remains of another collar. Here's a kitten with a bead collar, remains of a baboon. And then again, you can see uh, 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 these cats, this one wearing a bronze collar you see here. And another one we just excavated uh, this past February uh, wearing a bronze plaque and we hadn't cleaned it up. Uh, so we don't know if it's like a name tag or owner's name or what might be on that. And then uh, some of the other monkeys in addition to the rare uh, examples from the subcontinent, uh, we also have uh, uh, monkeys that are traditionally found closer to Egypt such as these uh, griffet monkeys. Again, we know they're pets 
uh, because they're wearing iron collars. And you see an example of what a grivet monkey looks like there. And then the bottom right gives you the range of the grivet monkeys, at least uh, today. Uh, lots of beads, and we found thousands of these. And if any of you have been excavating at R.A. Kamidu or Patanam are well aware of, of the vast number of beads that turn up there. Uh, the, we don't find uh, them as in large numbers at Veronica, but very interestingly, we find large numbers of beads from the subcontinent. Uh, and also from Sri Lanka, especially in the late period. That's the fourth, fifth, sixth centuries. So I'll just give you a brief sampling of some of the beads here. So many of these, of course, are Mediterranean made or Egyptian made, made elsewhere in the Near East, or as I've indicated to you, uh, from the subcontinent. So here you see some of the various Indo-Pacific beads. I think many of you will be familiar with these. Uh, very interesting lay this bead from Jatim. Um, uh, on Eastern Java and Indonesia is the uh, one artifact we have that uh, comes from uh, further east uh, than the subcontinent. Uh, the preservation, as I said, is excellent. So we actually have some of the original strings uh, on which the beads uh, were put. And that's what you see here. And then lots of glass. And of course, many of you are familiar with the Periplus of the Erythrian Sea, and it, it discusses um, the export of glass to Southern Arabia and to India. So I'll give you a, a quick run through sampling of the glass that we have found. We found lots of this uh, dating especially from the first through the fourth and fifth centuries AD. Some of it's painted as you see there, the fish scene. Uh, I think many of you will recognize uh, the top right slide. These pillar bowls, glass pillar bowls are ubiquitous from about 50 BC to 50 AD, and they're found not only all over the Mediterranean world, but exported, of course, to Arabia, the Persian Gulf, the subcontinent, and into Central Asia. And here's some more. So we have excellent examples of, of glass, very high quality in many cases, uh, that was not only probably destined for export, but broken before it could be shipped, uh, but would have been used, of course, by some of the residence uh, in Berenike uh, itself. And here are some more from the later period. So there's uh, good examples of mosaic glass and painted glass. If you look very carefully, I think you will see the head of a duck or a goose here and then his feet here. So we have some really great examples uh, of glass. Of course, the uh, excellent uh, state of preservation due, the, due to the arid climate means that we have a lot of organic remains that you would not find uh, in the subcontinent. Lots of uh, basketry, matting, rope of various kinds. Uh, and you see some uh, very few examples here. We have quite a bit of this, remains of a broom or a brush, some, some woven straps. Here's some of the string. That's a fishing net on the bottom right. That's a net weight. They often would just take ropes or strings, time around rocks, and of course, then that would pull the nets down to the bottom, uh, and then they could uh, catch whatever uh, bottom-dwelling uh, marine life they wanted. And then just an array of other things. There was manufacturing on the site. This is the remains of turtle shell, uh, the lead seal, probably sealed a box of some kind. These leather girths might have used, been used uh, for sails, as you'll see later on, tent girths, animal girths, uh, all kinds of possibilities there. Uh, lots of jar stoppers. No one really thinks of modern bottle caps as being of any use, but they're, they're ancient equivalent, uh, made in all kinds of materials, especially plaster, uh, wood, clay and so on are often decorated and sized or impressed with uh, information that tells us something about uh, the contents of the jar, or who manufactured it or where it was made. So um, important sources of information uh, coming from an unlikely uh, medium. Coins, of course, uh, interestingly, we don't have that many in all of the seasons. We've got maybe uh, between eight and 900, which isn't really that many from a site like this. Uh, they're, for the most part, Ptolemaic issues uh, by that dynasty that I mentioned, uh, uh, ruling Egypt uh, from after oh, a decade or two after the death of Alexander the Great to about 30 BC when the Romans took over Egypt. And, and the vast majority of the coins we get are Roman. And there's an example of one of them down there of the Roman Emperor Caligula. Uh, we, we have a fair amount of imported pottery, of course, at Berenike. Imported fineware, though, not too much. Here's some examples of items coming from the Mediterranean, a lamp handle, 
some stamped terra sigillata here, some more here. We used to believe this little auxiliary soldier was Roman, but most recently we think, uh, in fact, it might have been made in India at Ter up in the north, which had a big terracotta industry. So we're working on this. And if any of you have a, an opinion, we would, of course, uh, welcome feedback. Uh, by far and away, the most important of the, of the um, ceramic materials are the amphoras. They probably make up 95% of all of the pottery we find, and we find literally every season metric tons of this. What makes these jars so important, of course, they were the ubiquitous Mediterranean um, storage and shipment amphoras for grain and wine and oil, uh, things like that, fruit occasionally, fish sauce, items like that. Uh, and of course, they have very distinctive shapes and sizes and fabrics. And studying those uh, allows us to determine where these were made and when. And of course, that then allows us to create uh, a network uh, that fed these materials into Berenike and then onward for export uh, outside of the Roman world. And I think many of you are familiar, of course, with the large numbers of amphoras uh, that have turned up in India, especially at Patanam and at Ari Kamidu and elsewhere. Um, we do have uh, the occasional, what we would call exotic pottery. Um, we have the Nabataeans. Uh, we can't really get into that. They were a trade empire in, in what is Jordan today for the most part. There's an example of a fine where Nabataean shirt that we found at the site. And we have a little bit of material from the Persian Gulf, but not much. And of course, the Periplus of the Erythrian Sea tells us that there wasn't, at least at the time of the Periplus in about the mid first century AD, it tells us that there really wasn't a lot of direct contact uh, between the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. The, each of these areas was involved in a separate set of trade routes, apparently. Uh, a major import uh, from Southern Arabia, the Horn of Africa, was of course frankincense. Uh, if you take a look at the map on the top right there, you can see the major frankincense uh, growing areas in what is uh, Southern Arabia today, basically Yemen, parts of Oman, uh, the Horn of Africa, and the island of Socotra, basically frankincense. Uh, the genus is Boswellia. There are numerous species of frankincense within the genus. It's basically a tree, and the tree is bled for its gum resins, which you see there, uh, which then solidify and are sold and still used today, uh, of course, for uh, burning for, uh, for the fragrance. And you can see there, this is a picture I took uh, in 2007 or 8, I can't remember which, um, in the souk in the Arab market in Yemen, in Sana'a, and it shows frankincense for sale there. And this is how it's burned, and this is what it looks like in the archaeological record. Here's some of the other uh, aromatics that we find at the site, and here's a piece of frankincense wood uh, that we found at Berenike. I'm not sure why it's carved like that. Uh, other evidence of contacts with Southern Arabia include a number of graffiti uh, carved, as you can see, on jars. Uh, these are all in Hadramati, which is a pre-Islamic South Arabian language. Uh, and you can see some of the writings there. And then, of course, lots of material from India, uh, the subcontinent in general, not just India. Um, early in our excavations, we uh, discovered this Tamil Brahmi graffito on the left, which has been well published, and many of you may already know about that. We get, of course, the famous rouletted ware, uh, which is found all over the subcontinent and, uh, and uh, obviously at our site and is as far east as we know, and as you know, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, and so on. So these are early. Uh, the swastika we found in a 5th century AD trash dump, and as all of you know, uh, it's, it's a good luck symbol in the subcontinent, and it, it first came into the Mediterranean world probably in about the 10th century BC, serving uh, the same function among the Greeks and the Romans as it did and still does uh, in the subcontinent. Uh, in addition to some of the fine wares, like the roulette that you saw in the previous image, we get a lot of coarse wares, cooking wares, lamps, things like this, that of course suggest that Indians, people from the subcontinent, were actually residing at Berenike. And we're fairly certain about this, as you'll see as we go along in the talk. You'll see the very uh, famous paddle impressed ware there. Um, some, many of you will recognize uh, these kinds of lamps. Here's another fragment here. Uh, we found a number of these uh, at R.A. Kamidu. Uh, so, of course, did Sir Mortimer Wheeler 
and uh, and and uh, some of the French excavators as well. You just need to go look at the little museum in Pondicherry to see these. So uh, we find a, a not not a lot of this, but a steady stream of it. Uh, not only from the early Roman period, but also from the later uh, as well. And of course, we know one of the major imports, uh, this again from the Periplus, but we have lots of archaeological evidence, were peppercorns, black peppercorns, from uh, the Malabar coast, from the Western Ghat Mountains in, in what is Kerala today. And we found thousands and thousands of these. And then in, in 1999, uh, excavating just near one of the temples at Berenike, we found two jars you see here. And interestingly, the jar without the lid, which you see here, both the jars, by the way, were Indian made. We found over seven and a half kilograms of black peppercorns, making this the largest single cache of black peppercorns found anywhere in the ancient Mediterranean world. So that was uh, quite a nice find. We have a lot of other material from the subcontinent, uh, coconut husks. Uh, these did not just come in as, as floatsome or jetsome uh, with the tides. They're found in all levels uh, from early to late, total, uh, sorry, early to late Roman. Of course, we can't know for sure that it came from India, but as you know, coconut is a, is a commodity found throughout the Indian Ocean Basin. We also found a number of these Abris precatorius seeds. Many of you uh, will recognize these. Uh, 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 often referred to as gundu, I think I'm pronouncing that properly, rather than jindu, gundu mani plant. Uh, they have a very uniform weight of about three and a half grams, so they're typically used, at least they used to be, uh, in many jewelry shops in southern India uh, as gold weights because they're fairly uniform, as I said, with a weight of, of three, uh, three and a half grams. Um, uh, we have a number of textiles, lots of textiles from the site. And while many of them, of course, are Egyptian made or Mediterranean made, we have a lot of Indian made ones as well. This is one of the more interesting ones. As you can see, it doesn't look like much. It comes from a, a fifth century AD trash dump at Berenike. And as you can see, it's a resist dyed textile. You can see the rosette pattern here. And very interestingly, there's a very, very close parallel for it here in Ajanta Cave. Uh, number 17, also from the 5th century AD. Um, so um, clearly uh, they were manufacturing uh, this type of textile with this type of decoration uh, in India at this time. I've also seen examples actually in China along the Silk Road. So it seems that the Indians were mass producing uh, this material and exporting it not only to the West, to the Mediterranean world, but obviously North into China. And my guess is uh, if you had good preservation, you might find some of these in, in Southeast Asia uh, as well. Lots of various kinds of beads and gemstones. If you look at the beads on the top left, these are from the subcontinent. You have banded agate, you have quartz, um, you have carnelian, and not really quite sure what that might be. Um, and then we have, again, a sapphire, uh, probably from Sri Lanka. We have a number of these uh, cameo blanks, which you've ex if you've excavated at our economy or Patanam or elsewhere uh, in India, you will recognize these. So these would probably have come from the northwest part of India from the Barigaza area and would have eventually been shipped west uh, for workshops, probably in Alexandria, in Egypt or elsewhere in the Mediterranean, uh, where they would have been made into cameos. Uh, we do have some Indian coins uh, at the site, but again, not too many. This is one we found actually inside one of our temples that you'll be looking at later. You can see it's a Satahavana coin uh, dated to the early mid second century AD. You can see the Ujjain symbol uh, on the reverse and the elephant on the obverse. This is of course the region of the Satahavanas. I'm sure you're familiar with that. And then uh, the other Indian coin we found uh, dates from the fourth century. You see the silver one here from this part of India. And the only other non-Mediterranean coin that we've identified of the eight to 900 is this one from the kingdom of Aksum, a very important um, state polity uh, in the area of basically what is Ethiopia today and the surrounding areas. Uh, this became a very important uh, political and economic power, especially starting in the late third, early fourth century AD, when they too became active uh, in this uh, 
um, in this trade in the Red Sea and in the Indian Ocean. Here's some examples of some of the Aksumite pottery that we found. Again, not in the volumes that we've been finding the Indian material, uh, but of course, uh, the more we excavate, the more uh, this could change. Again, some, some of the textiles, many of them are very utilitarian, not very exciting at all, uh, but they come in different fabrics, wool and cotton, linen and so on. Now, um, what we've been concentrating most of our attention on in the past few seasons has been the Isis temple, which you see located with the arrow. Uh, when Berenike was first rediscovered in 1818 by uh, Giovanni Belzoni, uh, he concentrated some of his digging here, and a number of people who followed up after him, British, uh, Americans, or, uh, and some others, also tended to concentrate on this building, which is at the highest point of the site. Um, so for many years, we decided it wasn't worth excavating in here because these earlier 19th and early 20th century um, visitors had already done that. But uh, we changed our mind. Uh, and starting in 2015, we thought, well, maybe some of these earlier visitors didn't really find everything. And we were very glad that we did change our mind. A, a Dutch colleague of mine, Martin Hentz, was the one who suggested we, we might want to take a second look, and he was absolutely right. Again, our magnetic map is showing the location of the Isis temple. The big white areas are giant trench we dug earlier, which we could not run our geomagnetic survey across. So when you see these white areas, uh, those are usually indicate areas of deep trenches uh, where we could not uh, conduct the magnetic survey, which obviously was done after we excavated some of these trenches. So here's what we call an orthophoto. Um, uh, it's basically a composite of many photographs showing you uh, the Isis temple, more or less an aerial view as it appeared at the end of our uh, last excavation season this past February, 2020. So this is the east, this is the courtyard entrance here. Uh, then you get the courtyard itself and then you get the interior of the temple. So there's three major areas here and a number of rooms off to the sides, which you'll see are of some importance. So here's an artist reconstructed view of what we know now. Of course, this could change with uh, future excavations. And uh, we know, in fact, uh, from 2015 uh, on, uh, that there may well have been a much earlier roadstead or small port here from the 18th century BC when we know the Egyptian pharaohs were trading between this side here and Punt, which we think is down here. They were also interested in the frankincense and myrrh and other exotic commodities. And we have uh, several accounts of these voyages. And we think that Berenike may have been an intermediate stop for the crews, of course, to rest. And that's when they would have put together, uh, well, you've got eight fragments here uh, of this stele, this uh, stone slab indicating the name of the same pharaoh who appears in documents from the port up here at Mirsagawa Sis indicated in green. It was broken up at some point and tossed around the temple. As you can see, we found these pieces in different areas of the temple. We've also found some other earlier material predating the third century BC. This is a crown, uh, the red and white crown of an Egyptian pharaoh. Uh, you can see the possible dates there. We're not completely sure about the date, but somewhere between the 13th and the 7th centuries BC. And then some of the Ptolemaic items from the temple, although we haven't found the Ptolemaic temple itself, uh, is probably underneath the Roman one, the Roman period one that I'll be talking about. But certainly there must have been a Ptolemaic one here. Uh, remains of an inscription found by earlier visitors. We found a fragment recently that fits to that, and then clearly a Ptolemaic era stela in pharaonic style. Throughout the Ptolemaic and Roman periods in Egypt, much of the artwork resembles, of course, the earlier uh, Egyptian pharaonic uh, styles. So here again, a view of our orthophoto in the area in red uh, is the entrance to the temple, which you see here in two views. And very interestingly, just this past season, uh, we discovered this giant monumental inscription uh, in fragments in Greek indicating the individual who uh, dedicated uh, the, the reconstruction of this temple, very wealthy businessman as it turns out, to the goddess Isis, who was a god of, goddess of the sea. So you can see the importance uh, she would have 
for people at Berenike, mariners and merchants, and it's dedicated during the reign of the Emperor Tiberius. And I think many of you are aware that uh, a number of the Roman coins, of course, found in India do date uh, to the reign of this emperor. So here's some more fragments of this inscription. You can see this one here is what you see down here, but the bottom, as you see, has been decorated with a sun disk and some cobras, very typical decoration for, uh, for the Egyptians. Here's some more fragments. And then uh, our architect put together this melange, if you will, uh, of the inscription such as we have it so far. So as you can see, um, it's well over two meters across, so it's a massive inscription uh, is in such good preservation that some of the red paint used to depict or highlight the letters still survive when we first dug it up. And I think if you look closely here, you can still see some of the red and yellow paint there as well. So that was a very exciting find. And we know the facade of the temple was decorated not only with this uh, magnificent uh, inscription that you saw dating from Tiberius, but later on in the second century, uh, AD, um, uh, there was a redecoration, not quite as high quality, in Egyptian style, and we know that this was dated to the reign of the Emperor Trajan, his dates you see down there. And how do we know that? Well, there's a cartouche. A cartouche is a little oval-shaped thing, typical uh, in Egypt, that it contains the name of the ruler. And uh, we know that this uh, belongs to the Roman Emperor uh, Trajan. Uh, here's some of the other decoration from the facade of the temple, so as you would enter into uh, the temple. And then you come to the courtyard area, which had large numbers of dedications, uh, including statuary and inscriptions, the one Indian coin we found here. If you take a look at these square bases, they're all inscriptions from the Roman period, but written in Greek, which was the lingua franca of the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, these date from uh, the first century AD up into the middle of the third. So this, the temple that we, as we see it now, is from the Roman period. As I said, we have plenty of evidence to suggest an earlier Ptolemaic one here, um, but we have not yet found it. It must be immediately beneath uh, the Roman one. Here is one of the rooms off to the side, to the north, uh, which we had to sandbag up because it was collapsing. And then uh, here's another view here. So the area that you see in red here is what you see in detail here. And again, all of these square blocks contain inscriptions. So basically inscriptions for the most part come from the courtyard uh, area, uh, which is what you see in blue here. And the interior of the temple is what you see in red here and blue here. I sort of mixed up uh, the coloring here. So again, look at the ortho photo. The area in red is the courtyard area, which contains uh, most of the inscriptions I've talked about. And the blue is the actual temple interior. So here's just some overall views uh, of the temple, uh, not taken most recently. It's clearly had several stories to it. You can see a staircase, which would have come up to a roofed area. Uh, here you see another view of it. There's a little annex uh, on the outside of the temple to the north that we'll be looking at um, in a few minutes. Very important finds from here in 2019. And then let's just take a look. We can't spend uh, all of our time here. This is a room we just excavated in January and February this year, quite deep. In fact, we could not get to the bottom. It was too dangerous. Uh, but you get some idea of the scale. This is five meters down. We found uh, a number of interesting things. So this is an ostracon written in Coptic which is an early Christian language uh, in Egypt. And uh, again, in the southwest corner, another room, which you see here, we actually found evidence for the Ptolemaic temple, not much. It's, it's a block, a relief block, which we had to leave in situ, uh, but it's its location is indicated by the arrow. Uh, and this dates to the Ptolemaic period. So clearly it's upside down. So it had clearly been recycled from the earlier uh, Ptolemaic temple when they constructed uh, the Roman one. Uh, here's part of the roof beam. So this roof was stone, part of a statue base. And here's some of the objects that we found. This uh, uh, head, uh, uh, we don't know who this woman is, but uh, the red paint around her eyes survives. There's some gilding, and you can see her hair painted in black. Little head of a gazelle. Uh, these are animals found throughout the desert area 